Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We have limit as n tends to infinity of n times the n-dimensional integral of 1 over the sum from x1 to xn. All the variables of integration are from 0 to 1. If alpha is strictly positive, we can write 1 over alpha as integral t from 0 to infinity of e to the minus alpha t. We apply this idea here and write 1 over the sum as integral t from 0 to infinity e to the minus t x1 plus x2 all the way to xn. The integrand is real varied and non-negative, so we can carry out the integrations in any order. If we do the integrals first with respect to x1 to xn, all the integrals are equal to integral x1 from 0 to 1, e to the minus t x1. We can compute this integral and raise it to the power n. The value of this integral is 1 over t, e to the 0, which is 1 minus e to the minus t. The n-dimensional integral is equal to integral t from 0 to infinity of n, 1 minus e to the minus t divided by t all to the power n. Split this integral into an integral from 0 to 2 and another from 2 to infinity. Let's start with this integral. 1 minus e to the minus t is less than or equal to 1. So 1 minus e to the minus t over t is upper bounded by 1 over t. The integrand here is upper bounded by n times 1 over t to the power n. The integral t from 2 to infinity of n t to the power minus n, when n is strictly greater than 1, is n over n minus 1, 2 to the minus n plus 1. Because of this 2 to the minus n, as n tends to infinity, this upper bound tends to 0. This integral tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. It is non-negative and it is upper bounded by a function of n that tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. What about this integral? Let's do the Taylor polynomial of the function e to the alpha. The Taylor polynomial of differentiable function g of alpha about 0 is summation k from 0 to n. The kth derivative of g evaluated at 0 divided by k factorial times alpha to the power k plus the derivative of order n plus 1 evaluated at zeta, where zeta is between 0 and alpha, alpha to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. All the derivatives of e to the alpha are e to the alpha. These are equal to 1 when alpha is equal to 0. If we take n equal to 2, e to the alpha is 1 plus alpha plus 1 half alpha squared. The remainder term is 1 over 6, e to the zeta, where zeta is between 0 and alpha, times the cube of alpha. Note that if alpha is negative, alpha cubed is negative. e to the zeta is always positive. This means that e to the alpha is the sum of these three terms minus a positive number. e to the alpha is upper bounded by 1 plus alpha plus 1 half alpha squared. Replace alpha by minus t, where t is non-negative. We get the inequality that for every non-negative t, e to the minus t is upper bounded by 1 minus t plus 1 half t squared. Move the exponential to the right-hand side. The linear and quadratic terms to the left-hand side. We get t minus 1 half t squared less than or equal to 1 minus e to the minus t. If t is strictly positive, we can divide by t. On the right-hand side, we get 1 minus e to the minus t over t. On the left-hand side, we get 1 minus 1 half t. When t is positive, we have the inequality 1 minus e to the minus t all over t greater than or equal to 1 minus t over 2. Let's employ this lower bound to lower bound this integral here. Integral t from 0 to 2 n 1 minus e to the minus t over t to the power n is lower bounded by integral t from 0 to 2 n times 1 minus t over 2 to the power n. The antiderivative is minus 2 times 1 minus t over 2 divided by n plus 1. When t is equal to 2, we get 0. When t is 0, we get minus 2 over n plus 1. The value of this integral is 2n over n plus 1. The lower bound tends to 2 as n tends to infinity. Let's go back to the Taylor polynomial. We apply it again to the exponential function, but now we take n equal to 3. So we have e to the alpha equal to 1 plus alpha plus 1 half alpha squared plus 1 sixth alpha cubed. Then we have 1 over 4 factorial, that's 1 over 24, e to the zeta bar, where zeta bar is between 0 and alpha, alpha to the power 4. This term here is non-negative. It is 0 if and only if alpha is equal to 0. This means that e to the alpha is greater than or equal to the sum of these four terms, and this is true for any alpha. Replace alpha by minus t, we have e to the minus t greater than or equal to 1 minus t plus t squared over 2 minus t cubed over 6. Move the exponential to the right-hand side, these three terms to the left-hand side. We get 1 minus e to the minus t less than or equal to t minus t squared over 2 plus t cubed over 6. 
if t is strictly positive, we can divide both sides by t to get that 1 minus e to the minus t over t less than or equal to 1 minus t over 2 plus t squared over 6. Like this inequality was derived, we can also obtain the result that for any real valued alpha, e to the alpha is greater than or equal to 1 plus alpha. This upper bound can be written as 1 plus between brackets minus t over 2 plus t squared over 6. And this is upper bounded by e to the power minus half t plus 1 sixth t squared. We have this inequality, which we can employ to upper bound this integral here. The upper bound is integral t from 0 to 2 and e to the minus half nt plus nt squared over 6. Let's do the change of variables. u equal to nt. When t is 0, u is 0. When t is 2, u is 2n. This nt becomes u. nt squared is u squared divided by n. n dt is du. I can write the integral over positive u in the integrand. I introduce this indicator function. This is equal to 1 if u is between 0 and 2n, 0 otherwise. This is the upper bound on the integral as a function of n. We need to take the limit as n tends to infinity. Can we interchange the order of limit and integration? In other words, can we take the limit inside, evaluate it first, and then integrate? To justify the interchange of limit and integration, we try to make use of the dominated convergence theorem. Let's try to upper bound the magnitude of the integrand by a function that does not depend on n, a function that depends only on the dummy variable of integration u. Note that u inside the integral is less than or equal to 2n. Multiply both sides by u, we get that u squared is less than or equal to 2un. Divide both sides by 6n, we get that u squared over 6n is upper bounded by u over 3. u squared over 6n minus u over 3 is non-positive. e to the power this quantity is less than or equal to 1. Multiply both sides of this inequality by e to the minus u over 2. Afterwards, multiply both sides by e to the power u over 3. On the left-hand side, we have e to the minus u over 2 plus u squared over 6n less than or equal to e to the minus u over 2 plus u over 3. An upper bound on this exponential here is e to the minus u over 6. The magnitude of the integrand is upper bounded by the indicator multiplied by the exponential. Now there is no n here. We just have e to the minus u over 6. Moreover, we can upper bound the indicator function by 1 an upper bound on the magnitude of the integrand is e to the minus u over 6. This upper bound does not depend on n, the variable with respect to which we are taking the limit. Moreover, if we integrate the upper bound from 0 to infinity, we get a finite result. We can apply the dominated convergence theorem. The limit of the integral is equal to the integral of the limit. If we fix u and take the limit as n tends to infinity, the indicator tends to 1. For the exponentials, we have e to the minus u over 2. It's not a function of n. And for this part, as n tends to infinity, e to the 1 over 6 u squared over n tends to e to the 0, which is 1. Now we integrate. After taking the limit, we have the integral u from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u over 2. We get 2. Going back here, this integral was split into two integrals. The one with t greater than 2 tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. For the other one, where t is between 0 and 2, we obtain a lower bound that tends to 2 as n tends to infinity. Finally, we also got an upper bound that tends to 2 as n tends to infinity. By the sandwich theorem, the integral tends to 2, and the limit of interest is equal to 2.